bow heads with me in prayer. Our faith does not look to ourselves, Lord. Our faith does not look to those around us. Uh, we've tried it before. We've tried to depend on ourselves. We've tried to work out our life and follow the path that we see as best. Um, but many of us have already learned that our faith can only look up to you, the Lamb of Calvary. And we thank you, Lord, for proving yourself trustworthy, proving yourself worthy of our faith. And we pray, Lord, that as we spend this time in your word, that it may be meaningful and helpful to all of us, that we may grow in that faith, that we may walk more closely with you, and that we may have a clear understanding of the relationship you desire with us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Happy Sabbath. Apparently, I need to make some clarifications here. The title is a little deceptive. Someone told me that I, obviously, I'm inviting myself back since this is session one. Uh, the reason it's session one is because this is the basics, the fundamental, the first part of this marriage counseling. The Bible very frequently uses metaphors to describe the kind of relationship God desires with us. We are the children and God is our father. We are sheep and he's our shepherd. We are servants and he is our master. He is our Lord. Many different metaphors that the Bible is using, taking things that are common to humans, things that we understand. We know what it is to be a child and to have a parent. And God uses that to illustrate the kind of relationship that he desires to have with us. But one of the most common, one of the most frequently used is marriage. Old and New Testament, it keeps coming up. This same metaphor is used of marriage, that the kind of relationship that God desires with his people is a marital relationship. If you don't mind, I'm going to take this mic. I may come down there a little bit. You can go to the second slide. And the marital relationship, as you see here in these, in these passages that are on the screen, is used again, Old and New Testament, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, even in the New Testament, we have John the Baptist, who's quoted there by John the Apostle, as using the marital relationship as a description of the kind of relationship that God wants with his people. In this presentation, I just want to share with you, again, the, the foundational concepts, the basic things, the, the session one kind of things. If you were to go to marital counseling, and the marriage counselor is sitting there, and God is on the left hand, and you are on the right hand, what would that marriage counselor be saying to you? What kind of expectations should be had for this marital relationship? And that's the topic of our, our message this morning. So again, you see here that Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, all of these writers, New Testament as well, John, we have the apostle Paul as well, using marriage as an example. But all of them that are on the screen here use marriage in the corporate sense. They say that God is the husband and the church in general is the bride, or Israel corporately are God's people. That's his bride there. These are all the ones on the screen and many others like that. But the next slide shows us that in Romans chapter 7, verse 4, Paul makes a distinction here. You see the underlined portion. He says that you individually, not you, the church, not you collectively as the people of God, but you individually, whoever's reading this, you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead. Of course, that's Jesus. And so Paul takes it a step further. It's not just this symbolic grand thing, which it is, not just a metaphor for prophecy, but in terms of your individual relationship with God, Paul says you should see that as a marriage. You should see that as a marriage between you and God. That's nice, but there's a little problem with that. The problem is there are many different kinds of marriages, amen? <laughs> Throughout history and even today, there are many different kinds of marriages. There are different kinds of marriages from one culture to another. Within the same culture, there are different kinds of marriages. Uh, some people see marriage as a means of political gain. You remember Solomon, he married the daughter of Pharaoh. It was an intellectually wise choice. They needed a strategic partner, and they said, let's have this arranged marriage. And so the marriage was a political one. Is that what Isaiah is talking about? You think that's what Jeremiah meant when he said that the Lord is your husband? 
there's another kind of marriage. There's a marriage that is well-defined. It's very formal in its relation. The, the husband knows what he's to do. Of course, in most cases, he's the one to go out and to work hard and to bring in the money, bring in the material resources. And then the wife is to be the one to bear the children and to take care of the children, take care of the uh, deeds around the house. That's her role and this is his role. They don't necessarily know too much about each other. They don't really care about what they're feeling about these things, but they know their roles. And it's well-defined. It's a very formal relationship, not very personal, just a, a formal experience. We see this in the Bible also. You remember Abigail, the wife of Nabal. It says that David came, David sent his men to Nabal to seek help from him. And he said, no, 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 I'm not going to give you help. But the Bible says that his wife, Abigail, didn't even know. You can see here, there's no personal interaction between this. He's making decisions completely exclusive of his wife, and she doesn't know. And then even later, when she goes to David on her own, it says explicitly, her husband did not know. <laughs> so we see here a, a marriage. That, that's a marriage. That's a relationship. But not personal. Very formal. They knew. He knew what he was supposed to do. He was a wealthy man. He took care of the material things. She knew what she was supposed to do. Maybe took care of the home. Maybe took care of the servants. Maybe if they had any children, took care of them. But we see here a formal, not a personal relationship. Is that the kind of marriage that Paul is talking about when he says that you were married? I betrothed you to the Lord Christ. It would be good if in the Bible we had some insight as to what kind of marriage they're talking about here. That would be nice, right? It would be really nice if there was a recording in the Bible about the kind of relationship that a husband and wife had that inspired writers were thinking of when they're talking about marriage. It would be really nice if there was an inspired record of interaction between a husband and a wife and record of their love and affection. It's nice because there is such a thing. <laughs> there is such a thing in the Bible. Where is it? You all know it. You're embarrassed to say you read it? Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon is just that. It's, dis it's, an, it's divinely inspired material, and it is a re record of a relationship between a husband and a wife. That's what it is. It's just as inspired as the Gospels, just as inspired as Romans, just as inspired as Revelation. It's inspired material, but it is precisely as I described, the record of the relationship between a husband and a wife. And in this relationship, we can have some insight in some of the qualities that God is thinking of when he says that your maker is your husband. So let's go there. Turn your Bibles to Song of Solomon. This may be the first time you've done it in a while. Maybe the first time if you're under 18. This is the, 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 the Bible's record of a relationship between a husband and wife. Song of Solomon. Turn with me there. We're going to look quickly at some of the qualities that are highlighted, the things that are celebrated in this passage, in this book, giving us some perspective on the kind of marriage that God expects. It took me a while to find it. Maybe you're still finding it too. Song of Solomon, just before um, Isaiah, is after Ecclesiastes. All right, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, are you there? You found it with me? All right, we're going to look at chapter two first. We're going to look at some quick highlights in this book of the kind of relationship that this couple have because biblically this is giving us insight into the kind of marriage that God desires to have with each one of us just look at verse 5 stay me this I'm reading King James version stay me with flagons comfort me with apples for I am what what does your Bible say I'm sick of what oh that's so beautiful isn't that nice I'm love sick now, tell me here, does this sound to you more of an intellectual relationship or an emotional relationship? Yeah? You think so? I mean, there's things in here we can't even read from the pulpit. In, talk, in terms of describing the emotion, the feelings that they have for each other. Yes, I would say this is not an alliance between nations where you just have a marriage just so that you can have a strategic partner. This is a deeply emotional relationship. And this is divinely inspired record of the kind of marriage that God is, has in mind when he's talking about his relationship with us. Not just there. We're still in chapter 2, but we want to look now at verse 16. My beloved is mine, and I am his. Does this sound formal to you? 
You sound like they're just, okay, you stay over there, you do what you're supposed to do. I'll stay over here in, in the house and do what I'm supposed to do. Does that sound, sound like that here? No, not at all. On the contrary, this sounds like a deeply personal relationship. Again, as you continue to read through the book, you'll see that they were very intimately involved with each other. They knew each other. They cared for each other. They cared about each other's feelings. They shared their feelings with each other. They were deeply personal in their relationship. Additionally, back to chapter one, the second verse is the first statement in the song, in the, in the, in the book. It says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth for your love is better than wine. They enjoyed their relationship. Amen. There was pleasure in their relationship. They enjoyed physically as well as intimately, emotionally, personally. They enjoyed their relationship. This was not Nabal and Abigail. This was not Solomon and the daughter of Egypt, the, the Pharaoh. This was an emotional, a personal, a pleasurable relationship. And this divinely inspired record is what we're given as an example of the kind of marriage that God wants with us. If you don't believe that's enough, we can actually look at one person's experience with God and find that these qualities are there. Uh, if you go through, oh, thank you, you're already there. The next, next um, point there, pleasurable as well. And just stop there. If we go through, we can see that David, David had an experience with God and his relationship with God very similar to what we find in Song of Solomon. Indeed, many of the Psalms sound like they're just passages taken out of Song of Solomon and replaced Lord with husband. David, did he have an emotional experience? If you want to turn with me, you can go there. I'll turn to Psalms 116. Psalms 116, 116 Psalm. Just spend a little time looking at David's relationship with God. Psalms 116, verses 1 through 7, describe David's relationship with God. Was it emotional or was it intellectual? Was David's relationship with God based on the fact that he was logically convinced of all the philosophical proofs for the ontological existence of the divine Lord of the cosmos? No. <laughs> That's not what David says. Verse 1 of Psalms 116, he says, I love the Lord. I'm not just logically convinced that God exists. I love the Lord. Why? Because he has heard my voice, my supplications, because he inclined his ear unto me. Therefore, will I call upon him as long as I live. In Sabbath school this morning, it was highlighted that faith is based on our experience with God. Faith, yes, faith has reasons. Yes, faith has logical proofs and has philosophical grounding and footing. But faith primarily, the genuine faith that is unto salvation is based on our individual experience with God. That's what David is saying here. I love God, not because someone proved it to me with slides and a presentation. I love God because I called on him. He heard my voice and delivered me when I needed him most. I called on him for peace when I was grieving. I called him for help when I was in trouble. I called on God and he heard me. Therefore, I put my trust in him. That, that's unfortunately, some people don't like it, but that's emotional. That's emotional. And this is the kind of relationship that David had with God similar to what we find in the Song of Solomon. Not only was David's relationship emotional, also David's relationship was personal. Psalms 23, ever heard of it? The Lord is my shepherd. Now Jesus helps us out because none of us in here are shepherds. So we may not know about the relationship between the shepherd and the sheep. Jesus in John chapter 10 says the good shepherd isn't just an impersonal Lord over these sheep. Jesus says that the shepherd knows the sheep by name. Personally, the shepherd knows each individual sheep. And it's just not one way. The other way, the sheep also know the shepherd's voice. In the crowd, if everyone here was speaking, if that shepherd opens his mouth and speaks, the sheep know his voice. Why? Because they have familiarity. They spend time with the shepherd. They've heard his voice throughout their life. They spend time daily listening to that voice. And so even in a crowd, even with other people saying different kinds of things, saying alternate versions of truth, saying things that are not in reality, the sheep can hear the shepherd's voice because they have a personal relationship with the shepherd. And so David as well in Psalms 23 is describing the Lord is my shepherd. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. This is not a formal relationship. This is not God is just the divine deity and I am but his servant. This is a personal experience with the living God. And this is the relationship that David had 
with God. Similar to the Song of Solomon, a very personal relationship. But was David's relationship with God pleasurable? Like Song of Solomon? Like, like the, the relationship they had? Well, you know what? Psalm 16, what does he say? The last verse, David says, in your presence is what? Fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures evermore. Psalm 16, verse 11. David says, yeah, there is pleasure with God. It is fullness of joy. I enjoy my relationship with God. David said, I would rather be just one day in the courts of God than a thousand days at Six Flags. I would rather be in one, let's just give me one day in the presence of God than a thousand days watching unlimited streaming of any movie that I could imagine. I would rather just spend one day in the presence of God because that is pleasures evermore. David enjoyed his relationship with God. It was a pleasurable experience. And so we find that David's experience, David's marriage with God, contained these same qualities that we find in Song of Solomon. That David also had an emotional, a personal, and a pleasurable experience with God. However, if you haven't left it there, look in Song of Solomon chapter 6. Let's go back to Song of Solomon, looking at chapter 6. I wish I could end the sermon here. And I could sit down and say, go and do likewise. But there's a problem in Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon chapter 6, verses 8 and 9. Song of Solomon chapter 6, verse 8 says that there are, what does your Bible say? How many queens? 60 queens and how many concubines? All right, so let's, play, let's try to figure this out here. There are 60 queens at the point of this marriage. So she's now queen number 61, right? She's a, she's a wife. So she's queen number 61. He has 80 concubines. Anyone remember how many wives David, uh, Solomon eventually had? 1 Kings uh, 11 verse 3 says that he had 700 <laughs> wives and 300 concubines. So she's just 61. Which suggests there was 62, 63. And if I continued the rest of the month, I would get to 700. So what happened here? We see an intensely emotional, personal, a pleasurable experience. And it's a good marriage. It seems great. It seems wonderful. See, everyone's moved by it. You're, you're, really, the passion cannot be denied. But somehow, that passion faded. Somehow, maybe a week, maybe a month, maybe a year in, the honeymoon phase was over. And no longer was his emotions as intense and as strong as what we find here in this book. Somehow, maybe a month, maybe two years, we don't know, but he didn't have that long of a life, so it was probably a few months. He looked and saw she could be number 62. She could be an additional concubine. Somehow, what we find here in Song of Solomon did not last. So what this suggests is that the qualities we find, while true, while these are necessary qualities of a healthy relationship with God, they are not the only qualities that one must have in a healthy relationship with God. Solomon failed, perhaps because he did not take his own advice. Turn back a few pages, probably in your Bible, to Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs 31, it says it's recording the words of King Lemuel. Lemuel may even be a pseudonym for Solomon, or it may just be some king that we don't know anything about in the Bible. But regardless of that, the words in Proverbs chapter 31 are recorded as the words of King Lemuel's mother. She gave him counsel, gave him advice. It said, young man, this is how you should live. But verse 10 on to the end of Proverbs, the end of the chapter, is a record of what we would call the virtuous woman. It really, it would probably be better to say the virtuous wife, because much of it is talking about her relationship with her husband and her household. So the virtuous wife, the virtuous mother. And so here is described more qualities of what make a good marriage, primarily from the perspective of the wife, but there's also information about a husband. But more qualities are found. And I would mention that the qualities that we find in this chapter, that are celebrated in this chapter, these qualities are not found in Song of Solomon. Not only that, the things that we've looked at in Song of Solomon, the things that are celebrated in Song of Solomon are not here. And even this passage would go so far as to criticize some of the qualities highlighted in Song of Solomon. Look with me in verse 30. Favor is deceitful and beauty is what? Vain or fleeting, passing. In Song of Solomon, whole passages are dedicated to talking about the physical beauty of the husband and of the wife. 
whole passage are talking about, thou art fair, my love. You are beautier, more beautiful than this, that, and the other. But here we find in Proverbs, ah, beauty is okay, but it's vain. It's fleeting. Give it a few months, Solomon, and it's going to fade away. And then you'll find someone even more beautiful. This is not to say that beauty is bad. This is not to say that beauty should not be enjoyed. But beauty as a foundation for a marriage, uh-uh, it's not going to work. Not only do we find here a critique of some of the qualities in Song of Solomon, we find here other qualities, again, that Song of Solomon does not mention. First one I want to highlight is diligence. Diligence. Look in verse 13. It says she seeks wool and flax and works willingly with her hands. Also in the end of verse 27, it says she doesn't eat the bread of idleness. That didn't find its way anywhere in Song of Solomon. There was no mention of, oh yeah, you work so hard. You're so heavy, heavy, uh, diligent and, 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 and focused on your work. You're not lazy. That just wasn't there. They didn't care about that kind of stuff. But we see here as a foundational principle of a quality marriage, the mother of King Lemuel says, you got to have some hard work in you. You got to be diligent. You got to put forth some effort. You got to work. That's one of the qualities of a successful marriage as well as a successful relationship with God. Also, we find here in, 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 in Proverbs 31, verse 15, it says she rises also while it is yet night. So she wants to go to sleep like the rest of us, but there's some more work to do. And it says she gets up even in the night. She denies her own convenience. She denies her own desires and gets up and goes to labor for her household. We see this also in the end of verse... 18, it says her candle goeth not out by night. Now it's not advocating intemperance. You need to sleep. But what it's saying is that this woman is willing to sacrifice her own comfort, her own convenience, her own sleep, her own interests for the sake of her husband, for the sake of her family. She's self-denying. Again, Song of Solomon did not ever mention in any way this concept of self-denial. No, it's all about what I want. It's all about giving me pleasures. You, you please me, I please you, it works. But that's not the only way in a relationship, in a healthy marriage. And here we see self-denial as another quality of a great marriage. Lastly, or sorry, not lastly, there's two other places. We want to look in verse 11, verses 11 and 12 in Proverbs 31 says the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he will have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Here is mentioned that not only is she diligent today, but she's diligent next week, next month, next decade. She's consistent. She's faithful. It says how many days of her life? All the days of her life. It's not a fleeting thing. It's not just, wow, I'm just in love with you and this is exciting and let's just, I'm going to do anything that you want. I'm going to serve you. No, 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 no. She has some endurance. She has consistency. She's faithful over the long course of this relationship. Not only that, so oh, we can go down to the, go down a few. She's faithful. Not only that, it says her husband's heart does safely trust in her. And that's not just on her side. On the husband's side, he's seen her faithfulness. He's seen that he, she is trustworthy. And so he puts his trust in her. So here we find two elements from this same passage. We see her faithfulness, which is, again, a ne necessary part of a healthy marriage. But also we see that he, in turn, trusts her when he sees her faithfulness. You can go to the next one. That's the, the trust. So what we find here from Proverbs 31 is that this completes the picture. From Song of Solomon, we found some very good information that those are very important parts of a healthy marriage. They're very important parts of a healthy relationship with God. But the relationship with God is complete, is healthy, is lasting if we also include these elements. We looked at David and saw his emotional, personal, pleasurable relationship with God. But we can also look at David and see examples of his diligence. Psalms 139, the last two verses there. David says, search me, O God, and know my heart. He says to try me and know my thoughts 
and see if there's any wicked way in me and then lead me in the way everlasting. That's not a lazy approach to his relationship with God. He's saying, okay, God, I'm not sure of anything that I may be offending you in right now, but I need you to reveal it to me. Show me, Lord. I need some work. I need to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. Show me, Lord, how I'm offending you. Show me where I am not walking completely in your ways. And then you give me the power to lead me in the way everlasting. David was diligent also in his relationship with God. Yes, emotional, yes, personal, yes, pleasurable, but also he was a hard worker in his relationship. He worked out his salvation with fear and trembling. Not only that, in Psalms 51, in verse 13, just after chapter, uh, verse 10, verse 10 is where it says, created me a clean heart and renew a right spirit, etc." Verse 13, he says, then, after you do all that, then I will teach transgressors their ways and sinners will be converted to you. David was not lazy in the work of bringing others to repentance as well. Again, David's experience with God was not just emotional, not just personal, not just pleasurable. He was also a hard worker. He realized that this is a necessary component of a lasting, healthy marriage with God. And so David was not shying away. He was not eating the bread of idleness in his relationship with God. Also, we saw in Proverbs 31, self-denial. You remember in 2 Samuel chapter 7, where David wants to build the temple. A good desire. And I want to highlight this, that self-denial is not only self-denial of bad things. Self-denial is simply denying our will in contrast to God's will. It was a good thing for David to want to build the temple. God even commends him later for it. It was good that you wanted it, that you desired it in your heart to do. But that was not the will of God. So self-denial, yes, it does include things that are not good for us. It, it includes us denying ourselves of pleasures that are forbidden by God. It includes us stopping doing sin. But self-denial also includes submitting our will to God, even on things that are good. It, it may be a good job. It, it may help to provide for your family better. Uh, it may be a nice house. It's a good neighborhood. It, it may be, be beneficial in some areas. But self-denial includes finding, seeking. Paul tells us, he says, be not unwise, but understanding the will of the Lord. He says that we should be proving that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So David, like we should do, had to deny himself. He had to be willing to say, what is God's will? What does God want? Even though I want to build this temple, a good desire. So David didn't just build the temple, which he, as the king could have do, done, he called the prophet Nathan, what do you think? I think I should build a temple. You remember the rest of the story. Nathan initially says yes, but then he says no. God is saying he doesn't want you to do that. And David denies himself because he realized what God wanted. So again, we see this as another element of David's relationship with God. Faithfulness. Was David consistent in his relationship with God? I don't need to prove it to you from the Bible. You know that. But Psalms chapter 5, verse 3, David says, in the morning, you will hear my voice. In the morning, my cry will come up to you. Every morning, David is saying, I'm committing myself to spend time with God in prayer. I'm not going to get weary after the first week, not going to get weary after the first month, not after the first decade. I'm going to be consistent and faithful in seeking the God of heaven every morning. I'm going to meet God in prayer. Not only that, in chapter 1 of Psalms, verse 2, when he's talking about the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly nor sits in the way of uh, sinners and all that stuff, verse 2, he says, in his law doth he meditate, how often? Day and night, consistent, faithful. Day after day, seeking God in prayer and in his word, spending time in the Bible. This is a necessary component to a marriage with God. Yes, it's good to have pleasure. It's good to have a personal experience. It's good to be emotional with God. Those are great. Those are good components. But we cannot leave out the diligence. We cannot leave out the self-denial. We cannot leave out the faithfulness. We can't leave out, lastly, the trust. I don't have to prove it to you. That little boy, when he slung that stone and hit the Philistine, just before he said it, what did he say? The Lord who delivered me out of the paw of that bear, who delivered me out of the paw of the lion, that's who I'm trusting in. Through his experience, again, from what she, she shared with us in Sabbath school, he had an experience with God, and through that, he trusted in God. You may know that old song that says, through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. Trust is not something we just pick up tomorrow. Trust is something that's learned by experience. The last verse of Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. I'm so glad I learned to trust him. Trust is something that's learned. And David, through his experiences with God, learned to trust. So there you have it. There's obviously more things, but these, I believe, are some of the highlights of the kind of marriage that God desires with us. Emotional, yes, personal, all of these things, but we cannot exclude 
these other elements. Quickly, want to turn to go to the next slide, please. Want to turn to how we can enhance those qualities. So we have these qualities, but where is it that we may be lacking? All of us here, all of us here, I don't know you too intimately, I don't know you individually, but I know this, that all of us here are somewhere on this spectrum. Some of us are very Song of Solomon-ish with our marriage, with God. We emphasize the emotional things. We like to sing songs. We like to listen to music. We like to be moved. We like to think. We maybe cry. and we, We enjoy these things. Nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with it. But if we're here only and not over here as well, where we're doing diligence, where we're doing the mechanics, those things that are not always as exciting, going out and trying to share and what did David say, converting transgressors to his ways. If we're not over here spending time faithfully, daily seeking God in prayer, daily spending time in the Bible, something's missing. And if we stay over the Song of Solomon, unfortunately, our relationship may end like the relationship in Song of Solomon. But. Don't get your high, eh, eh, on your high horse. Those who are over here only, those who are only diligent, only working, only faithful, only focusing on self-denial, only focusing, not focusing on the pleasure. There's no joy in this relationship with God. There's just, I got to do this, got to make sure I do, oh, I'm cutting out that. I think God might not want me to do that anymore. Cut it out. Whatever it is, God says, that will I do. Those who are over here don't stand uncondemned. Indeed, Jesus spends the majority of the New Testament rebuking Pharisees who are in this camp. If you're here only and not over there, also, we are not having a healthy, lasting relationship with God. As with all things, the safety is in the middle. The safety is with the balance. Having the diligence, having the, having the diligence, having the emotion, having the pleasure, having the, 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 the self-denial. Having all of these things in harmony with each other and having these things grow up together. It's really based on our personality, I believe. That it's just some, I'm, some people are more emotional. Some people are more intellectual. Some people are more focused. Some people are Martha. Some people are Mary. That's just how we are. And whichever way we find ourselves, it's interesting that that's how our relationship with God generally looks. <laughs> that's how our relationship with God. And we spend our, most of our time over here or over there based on our personality. And we also find fault with people who we see on the other side. You just have an emotional experience. It's not going to last Oh, he's too mean. All he wants to do is be strict. All he wants to do is deny himself. I don't like that. doesn't sound like a relationship with God. You're right and you're right. But both of you are also wrong. We need to be in the middle. We need to have a balance. We need to be working to enhance all of these elements in our relationship with God. So quickly, just want to look at some of the things that we can do to enhance if we're lacking in some of these areas. So in the emotional side, sharing our feelings honestly with God. If I'm transparent... I find myself, uh, well, I'm not that far off. I'm over here. I'm, I'm, I'm over here, right? Or maybe actually a little, a little over here, right? <laughs> it's just how I am. That's how I was wired. Since I was a child, you're not likely to catch me crying. Right? I'm just, that's, that's not the kind of person I am, right? And so a person like me who's finding himself over here or right, maybe a little further to the left, what's, who's over here, what we need to work on is taking time to intentionally, in prayer, share our feelings with God. You may not be aware of our feelings. You may not be aware of the fact that I'm upset. I'm mad. I didn't like what they said to me. I'm, I, I feel hurt. I'm disappointed. I'm embarrassed. These feelings, sharing them with God. Take, out, take, take a look at the Psalms. Look at the way the words that David used in describing with such detail his feelings, pouring out his heart, pouring out his soul to God. That's what people like me need to work on. We need to spend more time in prayer. Yes, it's good that we spend time in prayer praying for people. It's good that we spend time in prayer praying for confessing our sins. It's good that we spend time in prayer doing other things. But if you're like me, you need to spend a little more time talking about your feelings with God. It's not easy, but we need to do it. We have to work on it. We go to the next section, the personal aspects. If you find that your relationship with God is not the most personal, it's not the most intimate, it's, 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 a, it's a little stiff. Again, you're a little more over here than you should be when you should be over there. While respecting God, because there are some people who just have a very, oh, God's my own boy, I can just dap him up and all that stuff. No, God is God. <laughs> we don't, don't dispense to the fact that God is God, but still he invites us to come to him as friend to friend. It's the relationship he had with Moses, with David. In the New Testament, Jesus says, I don't call you servants, I call you friends. God wants us to come to him and share with him personally 
the things that are going on with us, with, with us in our lives. Also in Bible study, this is a thing that happens to people like me a lot. We sometimes are tempted to focus on application of scriptures that have nothing to do with us. We'll spend all of our time in the Bible studying the Sabbath. Well, look, I'm convinced. I've been convinced for how many decades about the Sabbath, right? That's not anything personal about that. Nothing wrong with it. It's good. You want to help share with others. all well and good. But you need to have a personal message from God in the Bible. We need to go to the Bible, and the Bible, it needs to cut. Not just cut those Sunday worshipers over there. Not just cut those people over there, those people out there, people doing. It needs to cut me. It needs to be personal. It needs to be real. Something, when I come from the Bible, if I come, a sinful, erring human being, in the presence of the all-pure, almighty, powerful God of heaven, I can't leave there without, without recognizing something wrong with me. I can't leave there without recognizing, woe is me, I am undone. I have to come into the presence of God and personally hear something from God. And so people, again, like me, we need to spend more time prioritizing personal applications over applications for others. I'm not saying stop studying the Sabbath. I still study it. I'm not saying stop studying some of these other principles and other doctrines and other things, but prioritizing. Primarily, I need some personal time. I need some personal messages with God. The next, you can go to the next one. Pleasurable. This one, again, people like me, sometimes we just, it's not, it's not that fun. <laughs> we focus on the, the, the rough things. And there are some t tough things. If we're going to deny ourselves and walk with God, yeah, we have to give up some things. We have to sacrifice some things that we enjoy. That's just a part of it. I'm sorry. But we still need to recognize in his presence is fullness of joy. Jesus says that I say these things to you that in me you might have joy. And that your joy, not just half joy, that your joy may be full. There is pleasure, there is delight, there is enjoyment in the service of God. And we can't lose that element. And I think meditating on the many evidences of God's presence, realizing that God himself is with us, that he walks with me, that he is near to me, that brings us joy. That brings us a pleasure in recognizing that. You can go to the next slide. There's also those on the other hand. Now it's good for me because I can criticize the people who aren't like me. Proverbs 31 qualities, the Proverbs 31 quality. If you find yourself oh, 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 over uh, needing this side, you need some diligence. You need some diligence, all right? We need to, unfortunately, this is a part of it. Yeah, I, I like to sing songs. I like to be moved to tears. I, I like to enjoy my personal relationship with God. I like to know that God is with me and walking with me. That's great. But a part of a good, healthy marriage on earth, as well as a marriage in heaven, is work. You got to put forth effort. We have to take some time, like David, saying, okay, Lord, I'm sinning. What, what ways am I sinning? Show me, Lord. Search me and, 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 and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Tell me how I am not walking in your ways. And then give me the power, as you have promised, to be led in the way everlasting, to overcome these sins. Also, we got to do some work for others. Got to go out. We got to tell people Jesus loves you. Jesus wants you to have a better life. Jesus wants you to give up these ways that are harming you. And he's coming soon. And you need to know that in his soon coming, if you're not making a decision for him, it's only going to work out for your detriment. Got to work. That's, to be, that's a necessary component of a healthy and lasting relationship with God. You can go to the next one. Another part of it is self-denial. Again, people over here, it's just not... It's just not really a thing we focus on. It's just like, again, marriage. Who talks about, yeah, I can't wait to get married so I can tell my wife everywhere I'm going to be? <laughs> no one says that. <laughs> no one wants to talk about that. I can't wait till I get married so I can't travel as much as freedom because now it's two flights instead of one. Can't wait to get married because I can't do... No one, no one wants to focus on that. Who, who talks about that? But it, unfortunately, it's a reality. It's a part of the relationship. And similarly with a relationship with God, there are areas of self-denial. We have to work on denying self. Self must be crucified. And so finding areas, what ways, I'm not just talking about sin. What ways in my life am I doing things that are good, things that are okay, but these things are not in harmony with God's good, acceptable, and perfect will for my life. In the next section, faithfulness. This one's, again, it's difficult in general for people who are over on this side. You're generally people who are on this side, they have more of a spontaneous experience. They have a more of impromptu. And those things are good. That, that's well. That's a good, that brings life to a relationship. A relationship that's just too rigid and every day you do the same thing, it's not healthy. But there has to be some areas of faithfulness. 
there has to be some consistency. There has to be some things that we do. We have to, there's no relationship with God without daily prayer and Bible study. We, we can't get around it. That's a, a place where we have to be consistent. And if we're not inclined to do that, by the grace of God, let us push towards that. You miss a day? Okay. Get back up tomorrow. Start again. But that's a necessary and, and in, indispensable component in a healthy, lasting relationship with God. Finally, trust. The last one there, trust. Just keep walking with him. Just keep being mindful of the fact that God is with us. And through that, as the songs say, we will learn to trust in him. We will learn to trust in God. You can go to the last slide, please. This is it. This is what we looked at here. Just seven principles of how we can have a lasting, a healthy marriage with God. God, yes, he wants this marriage. He wants this marriage with us individually. But these things are in all indispensable components of that relationship. Would you bow your heads with me? What I want to do is spend some time in private prayer. And you see these things on the screen here. These seven things. Uh, I, I didn't see any halos when I walked in. So I'm going to assume that some people in here, all of us in here, have some areas where we need work. On one, two, three, four of these areas. That our relationship with God, we, we may be doing well in some sides of it, some parts of it, but we need some enhancements in some other areas. What I want to do is give you some time, private time in prayer, to ask God to help you think of it. You may not need prayer, you may already know. <laughs> but what we want to do is spend some time focusing on that, and then focusing, I've given some thoughts, but think of it with yourself. What can you do in your relationship with God to enhance this part of your experience with him? What can you do? What can you change about how you relate to God? What can you change about your daily life that will help to increase your strength in these areas? Go ahead and bow your heads with me, and I'll close um, in prayer after. Our Father and our God, it is an amazing thing that the all-powerful creator of the universe desires to be in fellowship with me, that you desire to walk with us. You desire to hear of our trivial and light and trite concerns. You want to know what bothers us. You want to be in a personal relationship with us. You want to walk with us. My brothers and sisters here, as well as myself, we are, none of us have found that perfect balance. We need growth in these different areas. And in Jesus' name, Father, we're asking that you will help us, that you will help us to have the, 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 the strength, to have the consistency to push for growth where we need it most. As I trust you have done, I pray that you will seal these decisions, that you will seal these efforts that individuals have made that saying, I want to move, I want to grow in my emotional relationship with God. I want to be more faithful. I want to be more self-denying. I, I want to have more pleasure in my experience. Whatever that is, Father, I ask that you will take it and that you will seal it and that you will give us the strength that we need to overcome. Thank you for your word. I um, thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.